This video is going to look at the full setup of a bar element problem. So we're going to start from the physical problem and then define the full finite element analysis model for it. We will then walk through the solution and post-processing. Here is the bar element problem that we're going to use for this example. It's got several things going on. I'll talk through it really quick. We've got three different bars of different lengths different diameters, different lengths. We've got an end reaction on the left side, a point load applied at the transition between the two diameters, first transitions. We've got a distributed force along the first two diameter segments. And then lastly, we have an imposed non-zero displacement acting on the right side of the bar. So lots of different things happening here. Let's start out by defining the model that we're going to apply to this. And the obvious thing to do is to break the model where the geometry uh, where the geometry changes or where loads are applied. In this case, P acts at a point of geometry change. So it's uh, a single point. We'll use that as a boundary. Then we're going to want to label those nodes that occur right at the edges of each of the elements. And recall that where the nodes exist between two elements, they are shared between the elements. That's what gives us the continuity equations that allow us to pull this all together. Next, we need to label the elements. And for right now, I'm gonna use these big circles so we can keep the numbers distinct from each other. So I've got three elements and four nodes in this problem. Then I wanna define the properties in each one of these. And the properties are going to be the cross-sectional area, the Young's modulus, and the length. And recall that for a bar element, the stiffness matrix is just the AE over L for that bar multiplied by 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. So that's what I've tried to illustrate here. I've got the same appearance of my stiffness matrix, but the numbers could be different depending on the properties in each one of these elements. Once I have the stiffness matrix for my system, or for each of the elements in my system, I need to then look at the forces that are acting on the elements. And this problem has a distributed load shown W. So in order to find the elemental forces that are produced by that distributed load, I need to use the expression that we got from the potential energy derivation. So F equals the integral over the volume of the shape function matrix transpose times the body force vector times uh, dV. Now, I've chosen to use the body force term here. For a bar element, I could call that distributed load W either a body force or a surface traction because in a bar element, the edges and the body are the same in the element. In this case, I chose to use the body force terminology. Whichever one you use, you would get the same answers. Let's see how this works out. So the shape function matrix for a bar element is one minus x over l and x over l. And those two expressions are gonna be in the, um, in the two separate columns of the shape function matrix. When I take the transpose, they're gonna be the two rows of the transpose. The next term then is the body force vector. So the body force vector is w, force per unit length, but remember a body force needs to be force per unit volume. So I have to also divide by the cross-sectional area. So W over A1 gives me the body force term, force per unit volume. And then I'm going to convert my DV, my volume differential, over to a DX by multiplying by the cross-sectional area. So this is assuming I have a constant cross-sectional area. And you can see what happens, those two A1s cancel. So I don't even need to know the cross-sectional area in order to be able to, to move forward with this to get the force vector. So I evaluate that integral and it comes out to simply 1 half WL1 and 1 half WL1. As you might expect, the body force terms are equal on each side. So what does this physically mean? Let's talk about that very quickly here. This is the forces acting on element one at its two nodes. So the force at the left node is 1 half WL1, and the force at the right node is 1 half WL1. These are both positive, which means they are acting in the positive X direction, to the, so to the right of the screen here. So let's see what happens when we do this, the, that on the second element. 
Um, actually, it all looks the same for the second element, and we end up with the same expression, the only difference being that the length might be different. So this is for a uniform traction, and we see that the analysis is very simple. Now, if the traction varied with respect to position, then W would depend on position, and I would end up with different forces at the two ends. Note that the right-hand element, um, element 3, doesn't have any force from the distributed load. So note that this is only for the distributed load. I've still got three point loads shown on the figure, R1, P, and R4. I need to add them in, but we're going to do that during the assembly process, not for each element. So I have point loads acting at the nodes for each element. I also have global point loads that I'll add in. Now that I have stiffness matrices and force vectors for each element, let's look at how we can assemble them together. And I'm going to do this two ways. First off, I'm going to focus on the algebraic methods. We're going to take the matrices and convert them just to systems of equations. And I'll show you why they add the way they do. And then in the next slide, we'll do that with the matrices themselves, skipping the, the breaking it into scalar equations. All right, so there's my system shown. I can identify three sets of matrix equations, one for each of the elements, but note that I don't have the external forces yet. These are purely, I'm sorry, the external point forces. The, the F11, F12, and so on are the forces I found from the distributed loads. So these are my three small elemental systems of equations. I'm going to write each one of these equations out. So if I look at element one and element two, you see my systems of equations written there as four total scalar equations. But by con compatibility, I know that the equation, the second equation for element one and the first equation for element two are related to each other. They both deal with node two. So if I'm gonna look at a balance of forces at node two, all of these terms need to be included. Similarly, when I look at node three, that's got some shared equations between element two and element three. So let's write out a system of equations, one for each degree of freedom, or in this case, one for each node, because we only have one uh, unidirectional system. Remember when I write out these equations that I also need to add in the external point loads. So first off for node one, that's simply going to be the first equation from element one and then add in the reaction force on the left side. For node two though, I'm going to need to include both the terms from the second node of element one and the first node of element two. So I get four terms on the left hand side, I get my two distributed force terms, F12 and F21 on the right hand side, and then I remember to add my point load, negative P. For node three, it's similar. I get four terms on the left-hand side, and then the two force terms on the right side. There is no point load applied at node three, so nothing added there. And for node four, it's simply the last equation, or the second equation of element three, but I remember to add in my reaction force, R4. So putting these all together, I get a larger system of equations. This is what I would call my global system of equations for this problem. And we're going to see in just a moment that I can get to this using purely matrix operations rather than having to break it down into individual equations. So let's look at the assembly process of these matrices and the external point loads using the matrices directly, not breaking it down into the individual scalar equations. So first off, I'm going to label the top um, of each row, I'm sorry, of each column of each of my element matrices, uh, along with the degree of freedom that it concerns with. So D1, D2, D3, and D4. So basically, I can grab a term here, which is my 1, 1 term associated with degree of freedom 1, degree of freedom 1, and I know that it's K1. I'm going to put that into the 1, 1 position in my global system matrix. Similarly, if I wanted the 3, three term, I'd have a K2, but I'd also have a K3. So we're going to add these together that way. Let's see how it works. So here's the result that I got previously. What we're doing is we're grabbing the matrix for element one and we're plopping it down here, but then we're also grabbing the matrix for element two and putting it in the proper location with the D2 and the D3. 
and where I have overlap, I add those two terms. So that gives me the K1 plus the K2. Similarly, I do that for the element three sets of equations and I end up with a K2 plus K3 term because these two add where they overlap. So that gives me the left-hand side matrix. I don't even have to write out the equations. I can do this visually. On the right-hand side, it's a similar process. I look at node one and I just have an F11, but for node two, D2, I have F12 and I also have an F21, so they add together. And then the same thing happens at node three. And then I add in a vector corresponding to my point loads. So that gives me my total expression, but it's derived straight from, or it's developed just from the matrices. So this is my global stiffness matrix and my global force vector for this problem. Once you have a global stiffness matrix and a global force vector, you are almost done setting up the problem, but you still have a singular stiffness matrix at this point because you haven't tied it down to anything. So we need to talk about how we apply the boundary conditions. So there are basically two ways to look at applying the boundary conditions. One is the way that the computer codes implement it for memory purposes, and the other is the way that you can think about it conceptually and actually do it by hand. So we'll talk about both of them real quick here. So the boundary conditions in this particular problem are that D1 is equal to zero because that's fixed, and D4 is equal to minus delta because that's being pushed to the left. So what I can do is replace the D1 and the D4 with zero and minus delta, and we're done, right? Well, yes and no. We now have a system where we have unknowns in my degree of freedom vector and reaction unknowns in my force vector. Not a great situation. You can't use standard solution techniques to solve this. So we don't want to do that in, um, in the code. So what we do is instead we focus just on these middle two equations or the middle two rows that will allow us to solve for D2 and D3. And then as a second step, we go back and use the first and the last equation to solve for the reactions. So let's see how we actually implement that in the code. So by hand, what you're going to do is just grab those two row, the two middle rows, the ones that have the unknown degrees of freedom, and write them out in scalar form and solve those two simultaneous equations together. Pretty straightforward. The only challenge is you have to remember that if you have a non-zero degree of freedom, like this minus delta, that term still gets multiplied by the minus K3. So you've got to include that expression here. In the software, because they don't want to change the size of the matrix for the solution process, what they want to do is come up with a non-singular matrix that they can directly solve. So the software approach is a little bit different. Here's what they do is they create a new stiffness matrix, KBC, and a new force vector, FBC. And here's what that would look like for this particular problem. Let me walk through the changes that happened. First off, the first row has been changed. The matrix equation now reads D1 equals zero. So I've completely replaced the first equation with a very simple one that says D1 is equal to whatever I know it's equal to. The second equation is unchanged except that I've dropped the K1 term because it was simply multiplied by zero. The third equation has a change where what I've done is move the known quantity, so the, the minus delta, I move that over to the right hand side. So that makes my force vector um, now all the knowns and the left hand equation is again, or the left hand expression is all unknowns. And then the third equation, again, I've completely replaced the, I'm sorry, the last equation, the fourth one, I've completely replaced it with an expression that says D4 equals minus delta. So that's the process that the code's gonna take. I don't recommend that you do this by hand because it's, it's cumbersome by hand, but in the code it actually makes sense for memory purposes. So once you solve that system of equations, either the, the two done by hand or using the code method, you still have to find the reaction forces. And you do that by going back to the original equations that you dropped out. So the first row up here and the fourth row. And now, if you've already solved the simplified problem, you already know D2 and D3, so you can use them to solve for R1 and R4. 
Once you find the null degrees of freedom and the reaction forces, you're not quite done. Most of the time you also want to know strains and stresses. So let's talk quickly about how we do that. Once all the degrees of freedom are known, you go back to each element. Remember that we have this expression that's true on an elemental basis. The strain is equal to the B matrix times the null degrees of freedom. But what you need to do is do this in each element individually because the B matrix is going to change for the different elements. And the little d sub i is those, those degrees of freedom that apply to this particular element. So you can't use your global d vector that you solved for previously. It has to be the, the local one that matters here. Um, then you can take the strains that you solve for and determine the stresses by multiplying by the D matrix, the, the strain, stress strain relationship matrix. But notice what happens here. You do this on every single element, so you have a patchwork system. It's like you're flying over the Midwest and looking down at the fields. The, st the stress state changes from element to element. It's not continuous. If you look at most FEA results that are presented, they look nice in continuous stress fields. That's because the code cheats a little bit. The code does nodal averaging. The FE software will average the stresses that are predicted at each node by all of the elements that share the node. So then it uses the average values at the node to generate a smooth contour map. So one of the things that you can do to check out how good your convergence is for your model is turn off the nodal averaging and just see how patchwork it actually looks. If we uh, apply a quick example on this, suppose I've got three nodes and two elements. So at node two, I need to do some nodal averaging. I've got a stress predicted at node two that's coming from element one and another one that's coming from element two. The nodal averaging just says that the stress at node two is the average of the stress predicted by the two elements.